Hello friends, this is Steve Reeder with the Sycamore Church of Christ, and I'm glad that you've joined me again for this period of Bible study. I want to share with you another in our series of Bib Overall Bible Studies. This is a series that tries to just simply make the foundational elements of our faith and the, some of the more uh, fundamental things, uh, doctrines in Scripture, and uh, explain them just a little bit clearer. You know, the whole precept is that this fellow here with his bib overalls on out in the field plant, uh, plowing, could he carry his Bible in the bib of his overalls? And reading only the Bible, could he come to know what God would have him to do to be saved? And the answer, of course, is yes. If not, uh, then the Bible becomes a... a a very specialized book that where we need help to understand it. Now, there's no doubt that there are things in Scripture that are difficult, and sometimes we need to help one another. But the Bible's written so that we might know what to do to be saved. God wants us to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So, thank you for joining me for this particular study. We've been looking at on our, in our Sunday morning worship over the last few weeks, God's plan of salvation. So tonight I want us to take a look at a phrase that we hear oftentimes and see exactly what it means. What does it mean to obey the gospel? We've heard that phrase a lot, but what does it mean to obey the gospel? And how do we go about doing it? First of all, notice that the word gospel simply means the good news. And specifically, scripturally, it means the good news of Jesus that can save our souls. We know from Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. The power of God to save is in the gospel. So we know then that the gospel is not just a, it's not just good news. It's not just a story. It has substance and, and it has the ability to do that which God intends for it to do. It is the power of God to salvation. The gospel of Christ Jesus. And it's explained a little bit further for us even we go into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And, and I'd like for you to get your Bibles and open to this particular passage because this is really the root of what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Paul writing to the Corinthian brethren says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Notice Paul says here in this passage, here's the gospel that I preached to you, and then he explains what that gospel does, and then he explains what that gospel is, beginning in verse 3. The gospel in a nutshell is this. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Because that event is the central event in the whole history of mankind. Everything that happened before leads up to the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And everything that happens after looks back on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Is there more to the gospel? Yeah, we'll see that in just a minute. But the central foundational element of the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. We need to bear that in mind. It's definitely good news, isn't it? But notice, the gospel must be obeyed. And that's where we kind of get into a problem, I guess, is that if if the if the gospel is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, how do we obey that? 
There's three verses in scripture that I know of that mentions the phrase, obey the gospel. And it's interesting how they work together. Romans 10 and verse 16 tells us that not all have obeyed the gospel, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Romans 10 and verse 16. Well, what will happen to those who do not obey the gospel? 1 Peter 4 and verse 17 asks that question. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? And then the answer comes in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8. When Jesus returns, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8 says, He will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we see this phrase in scripture, obeying the gospel, first of all, we notice that some have not. We notice from 1 Peter then the question of what will happen to them. And then we see the answer in 2 Thessalonians that God will take vengeance on those who do not know him and on those who do not obey the gospel. That's how important that it is. It's eternally important for us to obey the gospel and avoid that vengeance that God says is coming upon those who do not do so. Notice here is a, a representation of the gospel from 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4. Uh, the death, the burial, uh, the resurrection. But as we look at that again, we ask the question, how do you obey death, burial, resurrection. How is it that that can actually be done? And so some people will get confused, I think, by the phrase obeying the gospel. But I think we can see scripturally the explanation if we will look at things just a little bit deeper and a little bit further, uh, dig a little bit further into what the Bible has to say. First of all, the gospel centers around the greatest event in history, which is that weekend of Jesus' death, burial, and his resurrection. The gospel centers around that. That's the foundation of it. But something we must understand is the teaching of the gospel began in Genesis, and it does not end throughout Revelation. And I think that's something that we have to understand, that everything in Scripture is really the gospel uh, leading up to the events of the death, burial, and resurrection. If you recall, in Genesis chapter 3, there is a promise made to Satan. And he says that the seed of the woman shall crush his head. Now, he's referring there to to Jesus. He's making reference there. He's making a promise there that Satan would be prominent in this world, of course, but there was coming one who would crush him, one that would be bruised by him, but would be destroyed uh, or would be bruised uh, himself, but would destroy the one who did the damage to him. So we see that Jesus is talked about and the, and the gospel has begun to be talked about even in the book of Genesis. We have the promises of God. We have the prophecies of the Old Testament and every one of them was exactly right. From being born of a virgin to, to his, his uh, um, birth in Bethlehem to his, to his death. Every prophecy of Jesus came to be. And so while the gospel centers around the death, burial, and resurrection, we need to understand that every, every event that happened up until the cross is part of the story of Jesus also, including the teaching that goes along. And what happened after the cross, including the teaching that goes with it, is a part of the gospel also.
So the gospel starts in Genesis and it has no end. So as we look at the gospel then, and as I said, we've been talking about God's plan of salvation. And I think what we need to understand is how do these two things work together? If the gospel of Jesus centers around the death, burial, and resurrection, and God's plan of salvation is meant to bring us to, uh, to um, obtain the salvation that he promises us, how do these two things work together? And I think it's important for us to see how they work together for us to truly understand what it means to obey the gospel. So how do we reconcile the gospel? and God's plan of salvation. That brings us back to 1 Corinthians 15. The first four verses that we read just a few minutes ago, you might not have noticed it when we read it, but that passage teaches us how that the gospel and God's plan of salvation work together to create Christian, to create a child of God. So if you would, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 through 4, just a little bit closer. First of all, we find out in verse 1 that the gospel is preached. Paul tells the brethren there that he preached the gospel. In other words, the good news of Jesus. And he preached it from uh, all the way from the promises and prophecies all the way through the fruition of the cross and what happened after that uh, with the establishment of the church. The good news begins in Genesis 3.15, as we mentioned, goes through the prophets, and all of those led to Jesus. If you'll recall, after Jesus was resurrected on the road to Emmaus, he taught some of the disciples who didn't know who he was. And he began to teach them using the Old Testament, and he expounded upon himself before he opened their eyes to let them see that he was he was Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, Philip joined himself to the eunuch who was riding in the chariot, and they were reading there from Isaiah 53. And he explained and took it from that passage, and he preached Jesus to the eunuch. Now, easy question, simple question. Why did Jesus and Philip use the Old Testament to teach Jesus? because the Old Testament's all they had. The New Testament was still being lived. The New Testament was still being, um, it was still, you know, being lived out. It hadn't been written yet. They were able to use the Old Testament to preach Jesus because the Old Testament shows us Jesus. The gospel is preached. And, and preaching the gospel consists of more than just his death. It includes the entire story as we touched on just a second ago where Jesus came from and why he came. And then knowing all of that, it makes the cross even more of an impressive thing when we know that Jesus, all of the things that were done were done uh, on purpose, that God had a plan that began before the foundation of the world. And then as he created the world, that plan began to start to take shape. Preaching the gospel consists of more than just the death, burial, and resurrection, but every part of that teaching either leads to that event or looks back toward that event. And of necessity, a gospel that can be preached must be heard. Romans 10 verse 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. A gospel that can be preached must of necessity be heard. So we see here in Romans or 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul preached the gospel. Therefore, the Corinthians heard the gospel. And not only heard it, but they received it. Verse 1 tells us, I, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received. This good news, this gospel that was preached, gives understanding. It gives motivation. It, it tells us where we came from, and it tells us uh, 
what we need to do in order to be saved from our sins. And it gives us the understanding of that. Plus, it gives us the motivation to do it. When we understand from the teaching of the gospel and the teaching of the cross and the teaching of the resurrection that Jesus paid our debt of sin, that's something that has to be understood and received and believed by those hearers. Jesus paid the debt for our sin. He requires us to pay a price for our salvation. And that price is faith and obedience. John 3 and verse 16 tells us that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever does what? Believes in him. You see, the gospel preached must be a gospel believed in order to be a gospel obeyed. Romans 10 and verse 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice the motivation here. If we believe it, and we will confess that belief that Jesus is the Son of God, then we are on our way to being saved. So notice Paul says the gospel is preached and the gospel is also received or believed and confessed before men. And then we see that the gospel saves. Look at verse 2. By which also you are saved. If you hold fast to that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. The gospel saves. It's the central theme of the Bible. It's the salvation of sinners. Jesus paid the, his death, paid the price for our sins. The blood that he shed, the life that he gave is, was the price that God placed on sin from the very beginning. And instead of taking that price with our eternal death, God allowed Jesus' death to pay that price. He was buried. He was entombed and he was mourned. You know, why was Jesus buried? Have you ever thought about that? It, it seems like a silly question because you bury those who are dead. But, but Jesus didn't intend to stay dead. So why did they bury him? Why did he just not fall asleep, come back to life and show everybody? Well, folks, he was buried because he was dead. And, and to prove that death, he actually was entombed and he was mourned. They mourned because he was dead. But then on that third day, his resurrection paved the way for all of us to be raised from the dead and to live eternally with God. He opened the door of Hades. He opened the door of death for all of us. And not only did he open the door from death, but he opened the door so that those who were saved could live eternally with God. But the scripture teaches us that to be saved, we must obey. Remember, we're talking about obeying the gospel. And we sort of backtracked a little bit into what the gospel does, but the gospel is intended to save. The death, the burial, the resurrection is the, is the gospel, and it is, to, it is for our salvation, but it must be obeyed. Hebrews 5 and verse 9, speaking of Jesus, says, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Salvation must be obtained through obedience. So then how do we obey the gospel? Notice the picture here. The three elements are there. But now you don't see the cross. Now you see people today. The death, the burial, the resurrection. How can we obey the gospel? It comes from Romans chapter 6. If you'll turn to Romans 6, we'll spend a little bit of time there. But notice specifically right now, verse 17. Paul, again, writing to the Romans says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Notice that phrase, that form of doctrine. See, you and I can't die physically, be buried, and then come back to life 
in this lifetime. When we die, what's after that is the judgment. There's no coming back from that. So we obey then a form of doctrine. That form of doctrine. Sometimes you hear the phrase substance over form. Well, I want to show you how in repentance and baptism, we see that form creates substance or form is the substance. We are told to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus, for the remission of sins in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Why did Peter tell people to, be, to repent and be baptized? Because they had just been asked the question. They had been cut to the heart and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They had just found out that they had sinned by crucifying the Son of God. And they wanted to know, what do we do now? And the answer was repent and be baptized. Folks, I want to tell you, before we go any further, the way you obey the gospel is you and I must obey that form of doctrine, which is repentance and baptism, death, burial, resurrection. We back up to Romans chapter 6, beginning there in verse 2, and notice we find substance through form. By obeying a form of doctrine, we then put substance to obedience to the gospel. Beginning in Romans chapter 6, we'll back up to verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see it? There's death. Verse 2 tells us, How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? In repentance, we separate ourselves from sin. We intentionally separate ourselves from the old man that we, uh, where we walked according to our own will, and we turn ourselves over to God. Death is defined, really, as separation. Physical death is a separation of the spirit and the body. And we die to sin when we decide not to be slaves to sin anymore, but to now be slaves to the Father and to his will. And we put to death that old man. What comes after death? Well, burial. Notice our old man of sin is immersed. We are buried in water as a literal burial and a symbolic burial of that old man. And then we're raised to walk as a new creation. I baptized a lot of people. I've seen more people than that baptized. And they go into the water and they come up out of the water. The death occurs prior to going into the water. The burial occurs in the water of baptism. And the resurrection occurs when we come up out of the water. Substance through form. We obey that form of doctrine. The death, the burial, the resurrection. Just like Jesus. We're imitating Jesus. Verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We're obeying the gospel. And that's how salvation is received. Salvation is received through, through repentance and baptism through the preparation of the gospel and then obedience to the gospel. We hear the gospel, we obey the gospel, and that's how we receive the salvation given to us and offered to us by the Lord Jesus. But then beyond that, the gospel must be held fast. When we look back into the book of 1 Corinthians, 
there in verse or chapter 15, we read uh, verse 2, by which you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you. See, once we, once we take hold of eternal life, we have to hold on to it. In verses 1 and 2, it tells us that we can stand in it, we can live by it. The gospel goes further than just getting in the water of baptism and coming out. It tells us then how to live after that. And it gives us instructions once we're born again. Uh, you know, in John chapter 3, being baptized is talked about as being born again. And so as newborn babes in Christ, we have to have instruction. We have to know what to do next. We become a child of God through baptism. And we're always a child of God. But notice even in verse uh, two here. It says four, but it's actually verse two. It says it's possible to believe in vain. If we don't hold fast that word which is preached to us, we, our belief can be in vain. First Corinthians 10 and verse 12 tells us, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You and I come to the Lord intentionally and of our own free will. And if we have a desire to do so, he will allow us to leave him. So the gospel must be held fast. It's not something that we just do. It's something that we that changes us. And now we turn our attention to living always in accordance with the word of God. I want us to go back to the book of Romans for just a second. Romans chapter 6. And I want to share with you what is kind of a, a long reading, but a uh, it teaches us what we need to know about obedience to the gospel. And I want you to focus your attention on the word reckon when we get to that word. Beginning in verse 5 says this, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace." When we become children of God, we, like Jesus, ought to understand. From verse 10, it says this, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. When you and I turn our backs on our old ways and we're buried and raised to walk a new life, we need to allow that to re resolve ourselves to never go back to that life, but the life we now live, we need to live to God. And if we do that, verse 11 says, we can reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word reckon means to think or suppose. Now, those of us in the South, we know what that means, I reckon. But it also goes further. It means to accept something as certain. By obeying the gospel, Romans 6 and verse 11 tells us that we can reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. In other words, by obeying the gospel, we can be saved. We can put that old life behind us and we can look forward, not to a perfect life, but to a faithful life that will take us from here to heaven. And we can rest assured in that, but only by obeying the gospel. So let's summarize just a second. The gospel of Jesus is the power of God unto salvation. These are the three things that it does. Okay, remember the gospel is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. 
plus the teaching that led up to it and the teaching that follows it, right? Three things that it does. It motivates through teaching. It motivates us through teaching. We must hear that word, believe it, and we must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. That's our motivation. When we hear the gospel of Jesus, it motivates us to believe it and to confess it. Then it, save, it also saves us through obedience. We must repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And then it sustains us through its guidance. We must live faithfully in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to concentrate on this particular slide for just a second and notice this. What we were doing earlier was to figure out how the gospel of Jesus and the plan of salvation works together. And here it is on one page. First of all, the gospel of Jesus motivates us through teaching so that we hear, believe, and confess. It saves through obedience, through repentance and baptism. And then it sustains us through a faithful life. Hear, believe, confess, repent, be baptized, live faithfully. Are those not the steps in God's plan of salvation? That's how they work, along with the gospel of Jesus. When we obey the gospel, we're obeying the commandments of the Lord. But let's back up. Let's go back to the, I guess, the worst part of uh, what we've learned this evening, and that is this. Obeying the gospel is found in the scriptures three times in the New Testament. And we find in Romans 10, 16, that some have not obeyed. The question again is asked in 1 Peter 4, 17, what will happen to those who do not obey? And the answer is found in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8. God will take vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel. If we refuse to hear God's word, if we refuse to deny ourselves and, and live according to God's word, if we refuse to repent, return to him from our sinful ways, if we refuse to be baptized for the remission of sins, if we refuse to live faithfully, then we refuse to obey his gospel. And in doing so, God will take vengeance upon those who refuse to obey. But again, the gospel is a good news. All of this right here is bad news that comes when we fail to obey. The good news is Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus paid our debt, the debt for our sin. And all he requires of us is payment for salvation. The payment for salvation is our faith. Will you obey the gospel? Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you living in accordance with the gospel? Were you baptized for the remission of sins? Were you baptized at all? See, the scriptures is as clear on baptism as anything about how essential it is for our salvation. But man has perverted it. Some folks will baptize children against their will. Some folks will baptize those who who have not um, had any teaching whatsoever and, and may never have any teaching. Some people claim that baptism is not essential for salvation. It's just something good to do after you're saved. Some claim that baptism is to join the church. Folks, baptism has one purpose, the remission of sins. And if you haven't been baptized for the remission of your sins, then your sins haven't been remitted. And you still live with them. I beg you to go into the scriptures and see if these things are not so. Every word given by God is essential for us. And every command that he requires of us for salvation is essential. Will you obey the gospel? The good news is you can 
All you have to do is learn what God would have you to do. I appreciate you being with me this evening and taking this time to study the Bible together. You know, sometimes we may not always agree on everything that, uh, um, that we share together here, but my goal and my aim is to get you to study the Bible with an open mind and, and simply follow what scriptures have to say. And I hope that you'll prayerfully do that with this particular lesson. Thank you again for spending this time with me, and may God bless you.